here talking about one of the most avant-garde topics in all democratic debates. Everyone here is aware of the disinformation of fake news and lies um, being at the center of the campaigns here in Spain. We have seen this and experienced it recently, but it's not a topic affecting elections only or Spain only or the elections that we find all around Europe. It is an element that I believe has affected every time there's been opportunity for great flows of information. We have had recent examples in the pandemic. Very recently, we have had the example of Ukraine's invasion. So this is a concerning issue for Europe and for European institutions. I also want to thank the presence here today of Katarina Bali, who is the vice president and responsible for information policy of the European Parliament. And good morning, Vice President Bali. Good morning. Can you hear me? I hope you can hear me well. Hello. So we're here awaiting your presentation. But before that, I would like to uh, point out a couple of comments. Um, to see whether your diagnostic is similar to mine, and so that we can start this reflection from the perspective of institutions, of European institutions. This topic of disinformation, full of fake news and lies, as we have seen, is a topic that comes from afar and I won't go back to the reflections of Hannah Aron uh, of one century ago when during the 30s she spoke about persuasion of lies, but we could go back to approximately three decades in a reactive movement in the US when a gentleman who was the founder of the Fox Channel said something that catches our attention and that talks about new models of communication, talking about globalization and the multiplication of communicative stimuli, a new way of communicating, a new way of reaching information. He is Robert Ellis, and he said something as follows, how the citizenship doesn't want to know what they need to know, they want us to tell them what they or how they need to feel. And he was then talking about emotions. Uh, very fertile land, no doubt. In this contact that um, stays in reality, and this has resulted in a complex communicative situation between the different citizens of all around the world. This has also become global, and it has notably affected liberal democracies, which are the ones imperating here in Europe. So just to finish, only four years ago, I was lucky enough, and I had the opportunity of being at the hearings where the current commissioners of the European Commission were talking amongst other things that together with terrorism, one of the first threats and risks for European democracy was precisely misinformation. And four years have gone by, Ms. Vice President. So what has or what have the European institutions thought about to battle and to face this threat of misinformation? And what is the degree at which you place this threat? Well, thank you very much. Um, this has been very much of an input and, and a lot of questions have been raised. So, so I will try to at least address some of them. Um, now, first of all, um, I would like to come back to, to the quote uh, referring to um, that we should or want to tell people how they um, 
how they should feel or that people want us to tell them how they should feel. I'm not so sure if this is actually what we are seeing at the moment. I, it is all about emotions, that's for sure. Um, and the problem with the emotions is that you can uh, address and stimulate negative emotions so much easier than positive ones. Um, but uh, what the uh, change in the media landscape has brought is that you can pick which information you want. So actually what we are seeing is that people consume exactly the information that matches with the feelings that they have and want to have. And um, as unfortunately a science shows negative emotions are stronger, can, can, can be activated quicker, um, there is apparently with um, a lot more um, a lot easier possibility to resonate with negative feelings like fear, uh, like mistrust, uh, like uh, uh, hostile feelings towards other groups of people. So this just to, to, to react on, on your initial remarks. Um, in more general terms, it is a fact that uh, misinformation has become an enormous problem um, resulting from the change in media landscape. And we've seen so many examples. You mentioned the pandemic where it was really, really obvious and, and we still see the, um, the consequences of it even though the pandemic is uh, almost over. But also take something like Brexit. Um, Brexit was, uh, the whole Brexit campaign was based on disinformation, especially on disinformation about the European Union. Um, and f from the continent, it was difficult to believe that people could fall for this because some of the, the lies were quite obvious. Um, and of course, the most, um, the most um, flagrant example is what has happened in the United States during the last um, months and years um, with, with a president who, um, who actually made disinformation a strategy that is not created from the opposition but from, uh, from the government and whose whole um, power ba was based on disinformation. And we still see the danger of this even being able to come back to power um, and yes, and, and, and of course, we in, in Europe will depend very much on, on how this outcome in, in the US will be. But what we also see is what, um, what this, these disinformation campaigns do to society. Because what they do is to create a complete uh, division in society. Why? Because it's not only anymore about discussing if you think something is right or wrong, but you actually disagree on the foundation of the discussion. You actually disagree on the facts. Um, and then there is no coming together. If you have a look at the, Europe, uh, at the US, if you believe that this, this election was stolen or not, there is no way that you actually can get together if, you, if you belie one believes the one and the other believes the other. And that is what we see in the US, a complete division in society. And unfortunately, I'm also a British citizen. We see it not quite as extremely, but, but we also see it in, in the UK. We see a division between young and old, between, um, between uh, um, more the cities and the rural areas, between poorer and, and richer. Um, between the, the different parts of the country, but also within families sometimes even. So this is something, uh, this is why disinformation is so dangerous, because it actually rips societies apart. And, um, and this is exactly also why it makes um, disinformation so difficult to combat. Because the people who, who want to disinform, they have actually two sorts of targets. They, on the one hand, they, they just, they target very specific messages. Like for example, the Russian war on Ukraine saying 
it's not us, the Russians, who are the bad guys. It's neo-Nazis in, in Ukraine. It's them wanting to attack us. It's NATO, whatever. So it's very specific. But we also have a diff another strategy, which is just to, um, to create insecurity and doubts about the political class, so to say. I don't like this notion, but about politicians, about politics in general, um, about democracy in general. And, and that um, they, they do with a, with a sort of trial and error um, approach. They just fire all sorts of messages, even contradictory ones. Um, and and they're, they're, and create this this feeling of I I can't actually rely on anything. There is no truth anymore, and I can't definitely believe those who are in government. I can't believe those in power, and that delegitimize. This is a delegitimization de of of the whole democratic system, and we see this happening in well, I would say just about every state in some more, in some to a less extent. Now, you touched upon what we can actually do. Um, of course, what we need is people who can deal with this new, new media world. I guess I can't see you, unfortunately. I can also, I, I can only see uh, Mr. Gilibert. Um, but I, I guess the audience is young people. So, so, so you have grown up with this sort of media, media um, landscape. But for, for those who haven't, they really have to, um, and, and probably also for you to a certain extent, have to, have to um, learn how to, how to deal with it. So what we call media literacy. Um, and, and then, of course, we have to also uh, address m media itself. Journalists, what can you do? Um, we have programs for doing both. Of course, it's not only the, the task of the European Union of doing so, but we do. And then we also have, um, have um, possibilities to, to legislate. Uh, for example, protecting independent journalism. For example, um, obliging the big um, uh, social media platforms uh, to, to, to uh, address disinformation and others. We'll probably get into that later. But that just maybe um, as, as some opening remarks. I just want to underline that I completely agree with what you said. This is uh, one of the biggest threats uh, that we that we are facing, and I think many people are not aware of it. Adding uh, the the possibilities that artificial intelligence bring with them, to take away sort of the last sources of absolute truth that we had. You know, you have a photo, and and you can say this is this is what happened, um, or or at least you can. This is a moment in time. You can't do that anymore. Or um, the deep fakes that you can create also also in, in, in video materials, which is even worse. And, and at the moment, we can still detect this. There are still technical possibilities to do so. But this won't carry on forever. So I used to be a judge. And, and, and now you come to court and you, you lay down a, a photograph and say, look, this is how, how the, the scene of the, of the accident or whatever crime scene looked like. And you don't know if it's true anymore. So this adds to it, um, to the whole, um, to the whole very, very difficult situation that we are facing. So, so again, the, the the most important thing that we need is resilience of civil societies, resilience of of individuals to uh, to to address also common sense. I mean, if you sometimes hear what people believe these conspiracy theories, they are completely crazy. So. So, so this is actually the, the, the core piece of it, to, um, to make our societies, our democracies, our media systems, um, our political systems resilient to these, to these threats. And I might leave it here because I think it's more interesting to have a discussion than, than a long monologue. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, she, mm. Yes, Ms. Bali. 
we are listening carefully to your explanation and amongst other things i was thinking whether what is happening is not that prior to disinformation or its success there's always people there with the will to lie or to not connect with reality because of whatever interests they have but at any rate this is not a consequence of a cr crisis of democratic representation maybe there's a lack of transparency in democratic institutions regarding citizens and that has opened up that door to the success of lies could that be the case? Well, um, I mean, if you look at history, democratic institutions have become much, much, much more transparent than, uh, transparent than they have been decades ago. Um, of course, on the other hand, the, the will of the public ha uh, to, to know better what is happening inside democratic systems has grown with the, with the means to, to look into it, meaning uh, media, but also meaning uh, more um, civil society organizations who are willing to uh, to uh, to open up the black boxes. Let's put it that way. Um, I'm not. I'm not actually. Uh, I, I do see that uh, that politics and democracy can should become even more transparent, but I do not believe that the two problems are, are interlinked in the way that you just suggested it, they would be. Um, because um, if, you, if you have conspiracy theories, you can be as, as transparent as you, as you want. And we are experiencing, we are experiencing that at the moment. Um, there, you can still create any sort of narrative that there is something behind the scenes. I mean, just take this QAnon conspiracy theory. How, how on earth can you be so transparent to have people, you know, not believe that there is a club of politicians drinking children's blood to stay younger? What essentially is the theory of, of QAnon? I mean, you, there is no way that you can, that with transparency, what, I mean, do you want to show them your houses or your cellars, or do you want to have them take your blood and, and, and have them exa have it examined? There's no way that you com can combat that. And um, I also th think that, I mean, I'm not so familiar with the, with the rules in Spain, I have to say, but there are, there are very different uh, settings when it comes to transparency in the European Union. We have a European rule that we are enforcing, that we are uh, strengthening now. We had a very bad, bad corruption scandal. And as a result of that, we're, we're even step, uh, stepping up more than we did before. We have countries where actually the, the rules are quite... Um, not that ambitious, I would say. And my home country, Germany, is part of that. But if you look at Germany, it's a, it's a stable democracy. We do have right-wing, far-right-wing people rising now, as in all the other countries too, but the, the democracy is very stable. Um, and then we have other countries where we have very, very big, um, uh, very, very, very um, extensive rules on transparency, like Belgium, for example. But do we see that democracy is more stable there because people have to, you know, if you go to politics, you have to open all your assets. You have to tell people everything you own, your house, your car, the worth of it in the beginning of the mandate and in the end. So what I want to say is, yes, we need more transparency. Um, in the legislative process, where it is actually already very, very much transparent, you can listen to every debate, you can have a look into every document. Uh, you have legislative footprints in just about every, every system. And then also personally of politicians. But I don't think that that is going to solve the problem of disinformation because you, there is no way you can counter these, 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 these conspiracy theories with transparency. Uh, and beyond transparency, one of the key elements, very likely, is control of information as well. Let me explain myself. 
After World War II, in Europe, all countries understood that the right to information was a, priori a priority right, so the regulation of the media. In Europe, well, they all are public. They can be private concessions, but they are still public because there needed to be a control of information because right of information of citizens had to be guaranteed. And this right to information was linked to rigor, contrast, and truthfulness. All this is more complicated nowadays because there's not only the media and also companies behind the creation of content and dissemination of content and the broadcasting thereof, of course, and... They are based on algorithms we all know about. And amongst other things, they, based on our desires and passions, they look for those prints, emotional prints that we leave behind in our searches for information. Can Europe do something with these big content platforms or is Europe doing something? And could it be done without violating the rights of freedom of expression? But yes limiting the or, or making or guaranteeing the right of information of citizens? Uh, yes, uh, yes, I think that's a very good point. The control of information is absolutely key. Um, and it's so important that we still have reliable media sources so that we have well-functioning um, public media. Uh, we just today, actually, in the European Parliament, just a an hour ago, um, as Parliament adopted our, our position on, uh, on the European Media Freedom Act, um, where, where, we, uh, where we want to set rules in the European Union how to, um, to, to guarantee a, a, a free space uh, for media where you do not have, um, uh, for example, um, too much influence by, by big capital that nobody knows about, foreign capital that nobody knows about, media concentration, all these questions um, are in there. So, so we, we do um, actually try to, to, to deliver this safe space for, for a public media. But, I have to say, but, we're in a complicated world. If you have a look at this, for example, this European Media Freedom Act, um, what is what is good for systems where the public media is still working? Um, it can be counterproductive in countries where it is already failing, like Hungary. In Hungary, public media is a source of propaganda of of the a pure source of propaganda of the government. So there, for example, if we say you have to disclose foreign. Um, investment in, in, in media, um, then uh, you actually um, you actually more feed into their hands of the, of the Hungarian government because then they can say, oh, there's their favorite enemy is someone called Josh Soros, a Jewish um, entrepreneur, a very rich man who is trying to fight Viktor Orban and his his autocratic regime. And so he will say, look, this is George Soros again investing here, and he is a bad Jew, la, 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 la. So what is good in the one country can be bad in the other. It's, it's, it's in this world that we are in, it's really not that easy. Um, concerning algorithms, um, that is actually, um, I think, an underestimated weapon. Um, but it is also difficult to address. Um, I, when, when I was Justice Minister in, in my home country in, in, in Germany, I had uh, Mark Zuckerberg in my, in my office once because we were, I wanted to regulate or, or try to regulate the algorithms. Um, because um, they, as you said, they determine what information you get and who gets what. So it's very, very powerful. And he said, you don't have to regulate it because we're, we're watching it, okay? But he said very, something very interesting. He said there, there are ways of actually influencing the, the, the atmosphere in social media and, and, and to, to combat, and to a certain extent, these, these bubbles that, that then hype themselves up. He said there are two types, for, speaking of Facebook now, Instagram would be similar. Um, 
you have two types of, of algorithms on this platform. You have the algorithm, what you watch, what you like, what you share. And on the other hand, you have the algorithm, who are your friends? Who do you attach yourself to? And he said that they shifted the importance of algorithms from what you read, what you like, to who are your friends? Why? Because what you read, what you like, what you share is, is quite narrow. You have your opinion and this is what you, what you think and this is what you like. Looking at your friends, it's much broader. You might have your weird old uncle in there. You have a f f an old friend, friend from school has taken a completely different path in life. You have your, your children who may be completely against your opinion, you know, like children often do. They completely oppose to you, but they are still your friends. So, so this could be a way, for example, of, of opening up. What I proposed when I was a justice minister, I didn't succeed with it, and I understand it's difficult. My proposal was to, to oblige um, the big platforms to in, uh, integrate into their algorithms sort of a, something that goes against, you know? If you, if you walk past, uh, past a, a, a booth, a, a, a newspaper booth, you just walk by and you see very different um, headlines. They're different because there are different newspapers still in most countries. And why not have the same on social media? Like, if they show you out of 10, they show you nine that you like, why not oblige them to put one in that is a little different? Just so that you see there is something else. Because what is happening with these algorithms is that people stay in their bubbles and they believe everybody thinks like them. They believe, everybody believes I'm in the majority, you know? Everybody believes that American democratic politicians are drinking children, children's blood and that to become, to stay younger. This is reality to them. So if you have every now and again one saying um, this QAnon theory is being invented by mm -hmm -hmm, or whatever, just, just something going against it, that maybe at least you see that there is something different. It doesn't oblige you to read it. It's not a censorship or anything. It's just showing there's something else in, than, 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 your, than your opinion. Um, Okay, sorry, that was a bit extensive, but it was my, I'm, I'm really very passionate about this, this algorithm um, subject. And, and what we do need is um, these companies, the big tech companies need to allow independent um, oversight over what they're doing in the algorithms. They don't have to disclose the sort of mathematical formula, it's not about that, but the criteria, what they're actually doing um, what we have now is, is um, the DSA, the Digital Services Act, um, that we actually adopted, um, which addresses especially the, 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 the flops, the very large online platforms, um, and, and at least obliges them to, to have um, a system where people can, can address them and say, look, this is, this is complete rubbish, this is, this is, um, this is uh, disinformation, they have to act on it. And, um, so, but what we do not want, and uh, that will be my last sentence on that one, what we do not want, we do not want to have or even, or to be, but we were, sort of a ministry of truth. There must not, not and never be a, a public sort of institution that says this is the truth and this is a lie. I mean, I've, I'm, I'm German. We have a very dark side in our history where people did that, you know, where, and there are other parts in the world. I mean, Spain has, has also experienced a not so, not so democratic um, period in, 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 the, in your history. And it's always about people saying this is the truth and everything that goes against what I'm saying is a lie and dangerous. And we would never, never, ever want to have that again. So, so we need to... Um, to, to have rules, but not have someone from above saying, you know, thumbs up or down. Yeah, this is uh, precisely the, com the complex boundary, I understand, for all people having political representation. The fact of not being um, like 
referees uh, of truth, but actually we see that there is a, a threat. We need to have a kind of a regulation so that citizens uh, do not vote those who really want this ministry of truth. This is quite paradoxical. And we also have this paradox that we have um, seen some circuits against the media that exert kind of a public control, whereas we more or less uh, in media, we can know who are the owners of these uh, media and these platforms cannot know that, but we know that they have uh, huge benefits and revenues and sometimes this is based on uh, not um, accurate uh, words, so to say. Michael Sandel, uh, an American philosopher, says, and I would like to finish on that, but I would like to know your opinion on that. Michael Sandel says that the problem started um, from the 2008 uh, crisis, but he says that everything started with the globalization, in the sense that the globalization in its uh, narrative, because it is only linked to economic liberalism, well, um, this uh, crisis uh, distinguished between the uh, winning citizens and the losing citizens. And those who feel that they have won, feel that they have this power um, and this influence on the um, information. And they place uh, in this uh, category the representation, the parliamentary representation. Do you agree that um, probably the management of the globalization in the world generated some uncertainties and such a complicated terrain that it facilitated or enabled all these movements around communication and that this is linked to some business models linked to information that uh, are also part of this liberal uh, globalization. Do you agree with that? Well, I agree with the first part that globalization and the way it took place um, created uh, a lot of problems, uh, a lot of um, social injustice, injustice between countries. Um, and I mean, the, the question is, what do you define as globalization? And I, I would, I would say it's colonization, uh, which, which was, which was sort of the, the starting, <laughs> starting point of uh, of globalization. Uh, if you if you go that far, and we still the see. Um, see the damages, uh, especially on the African continent, but not only, um, that that this this way of globalizing um, brought brought with it. But yes, globalization has brought a lot of injustices, and of course also power from certain parts of society on over others, of certain countries over others. Um, but then I'm, I'm, as you might have already noticed, quite critical towards the, the big social media companies. But then on the other hand, social media in that respect is sort of a democratization because now every single person can actually say what he or she thinks and may have, have the same and have an impact. Um, and not not only that; it's not only social media; it's the internet as a whole. With a with a with a very good business idea, with a very good app, for example, you can, from from a very small village in wherever in 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 Asia, in in, in Africa, in wherever, you can actually have a big economic success. It does happen. Um, it, it's it's much easier than to. It's still not easy, but it's but it's it's so much more likely that you can actually get out of where you are at the moment um, because of the internet and social media plays a role. So, that, so there is this, there is both sides of it. Uh, I think the classical role of, of globalization is this, the one that you described. And, and, but now we do see, because media and, and the way of, a way of expressing yourself and, and making your voice heard has become so much easier to everyone. We also see the opposite uh, development. The, the problem being that in this whole um, cacophonia of, of, um, of uh, messages and, and, and news and, and opinions, it becomes so much more difficult to find out what, what is the truth, if there is anything like truth. I mean, that is, again, a very philosophical um, question uh, that, that we might not touch upon today. No, sería complicat. 
Yes, this would be complicated. I was uh, thinking about Nietzsche when he said that uh, reality is a convention. This is a, a utopia, but it's necessary. And then, well, that's what's happening in a way. We are all looking at truth uh, depending on our own interests. Before taking some questions here, I would like to say that there is a paradox in Spain that can be also extrapolated um, around the world. I would say that the pioneering element in the networks around the world uh, took place in Spain after the Madrid attacks through SMS uh, messages. So people started to send SMS messages regarding the information given by the government uh, during those attacks. And this uh, party really had uh, problems you know, during the elections because um, people saw that they were lying. But after, we see like um, sometimes lies are rewarded. How come this is uh, the case? What happened? Well, well, I'm not, I'm not sure if I, if I really got the question right. Um, I mean, the, we, um, the, the more or less new. They're not that new yes, anymore. Yes, I'll try to, yeah, I'll please, try to simplify please, it for you. Please. So we've, uh, so in the past, society condemned uh, lies, and they used, for example, SMS texts to condemn these uh, lies, and now. We see like the opposite. We see that uh, citizens are rewarding the, tr the, the lies, such as, uh, for example, in the US. What happened um, in our societies? Why in the past lies were condemned um, through the networks, the social media? Why now we are in such a different uh, situation and now we seem like we are rewarding lies? I don't think that that has changed. I think it's just two different situations. I mean, after after Atocha or the other terrible events, it was so clear how everyone felt. So, so it's it's a it's a common, especially in an, in a nation, it brings you together. But then you have other questions where it's not so clear. And I think there, it has always been the case that if you were if we if you were good at putting a lie somewhere, even before the social media age. You could, you could actually be rewarded for that. I mean, just take all this, these terrible incidents of anti-Semitism or racism across the world, across history. It has, I mean, saying that, that, that Jews steal Christian children has been a lie for centuries, even before social media. And, and I mean, I, I, the country I know best is Germany. That was also before social media. It's like 20 years ago or something. We had a, we had a state election and then someone, a conservative politician was about to lose and, he, and they, they just know that migration is always, is always a topic that you can, uh, you can get the emotion of people. And there was, we didn't have a problem with it. It was just that the government was thinking of giving people who had been in, in Germany for a long time, a second, a, a German passport as a second passport, not even as a first, as a second, as an additional one. And, and they just ch chose this as a campaign subject, which actually, I mean, what does, it, what does it damage in your life if a few thousand people get a, a German passport? I mean, but you had thousands of people, and they really went to these to these to these election campaign stands, and they said, literally, the, the question was, where can I sign up against foreigners? That's what that that was what they said, you know. So so it's so easy if you go for scapegoats to 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 divide. I mean, you will have sensible people who say, well, that, is that really our problem? I mean, come on, people who have been living here for twenty years who've never committed any crime, who pay their taxes to give them the passport. Is that really a problem? And then you have those who go, yeah, but being German is something so special. And blah, blah, blah. so it's emotions, you, you said it. Tackle an emotional question and you will have, with social media or without, you will have people running against. But with the new possibilities, the new technical possibilities, you will have, you have a different way of telling the lie. I think that is the difference. 
now you have the possibility of creating photos that never that don't reflect anything that ever happened you have the possibility of 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 giving interviews with with people who i mean who never nobody would have listened to before but now you can call them an expert and everyone refers to this person now for no reason so so the 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 possibilities of, of spreading a lie and enforcing it have increased. It's not, it's not the human nature. Human nature, unfortunately, if you touch on, a, on whatever a person is sensitive for, um, and, and it, anything about children, I mean, it, this may, it's maybe not, a, not a, a coincidence that both examples that I mentioned, QAnon and, and, and the Jewish, being being denounced are about children. It's so easy to catch the emotions there. So, so I don't. Uh, uh, that's that's how I see the developments that we are facing. It's not. It's nothing new. It's just. It's just a new a new technique which makes it more dangerous. You see, no. Um, yes, you're absolutely absolutely right. Um, I mentioned Hannah Aron, who talked about the persuasive capacity of lies, in the sense that uh, lies are uh, oftentimes linked to emotions, whereas reality is only linked to reality, in theory. Okay, now we will have some questions for you here in the room, and also we'll take questions from people uh, following online. I don't know, do you have questions here in the room for our speaker? Okay, I see many hands. You first. Okay. Hello. This is my question. As we said, f fake news are uh, not just a local problem, but a global problem or issue. And as uh, many global issues, um, we need the uh, regulations by uh, from um, or by institutions global institutions, and my question is, in this sense, do you think that uh, one solution could be to create an international institution to try and regulate at least the uh, news or the level of uh, truthfulness that they might have? Do you think this would be a solution? Shall I answer straight away, or do we want to collect questions? No, si, 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 una ronda y así mis... Yes, you're right. We'll take more questions, and you can answer afterwards. Thank you. I would like to know, do you think that the paradox of our liberal systems, and more specifically of the European media uh, networks, by uh, allowing this uh, freedom of uh, speech and by allowing more um, private concessions in the public media. So for example, um, if we take the example of Russia today and we compare ourselves to them, when Russia today organized uh, some fake news campaigns against European uh, countries and the US, around the events in Crimea. Now, with the invasion in Ukraine, uh, other decisions have been made. So we see that maybe the easy decision is uh, in our systems is to uh, ban these uh, fake news campaigns, these deliberate fake news uh, campaigns. Do you think that we are in front of a pseudo-authoritarian uh, trend? consisting in uh, prohibiting some media? Do you think that uh, this is an easy solution to attack the fake news? Or what do you think would be other solutions that we put on the table to, uh, to, to put an end to this problem? Buenas. Um, yo volia posar una mica el... 
thanks. I would like to focus on the final uh, users, the uh, audiences, and on the role of the institutions regarding this uh, problem. If we say that fake news and misinformation are a threat, such a big threat, such as uh, terrorism, for example, don't you think that uh, we are not putting enough efforts to make citizens understand things such as, for example, um, the existence of the echo chambers, as you said, that the um, media and the social networks only show things that you believe are true and that uh, there are many, many things outside that uh, vision. And also, um, so that citizens understand that uh, things that they saw on social media are partially truth or lies. I believe that this would justify some uh, communication campaigns, advertising campaigns. I think I think you are really young, but I can give you some examples. Back in the 90s, where here in Spain there were some um, campaigns uh, around uh, cocaine or around uh, smoking. So. I believe that maybe we should try and find this kind of complicity with uh, advertising so that people understand that they need to doubt. People need to be aware that this problem exists because uh, many people aren't aware of that. Maybe it's too late also because we do not just need to understand to, to explain this to people, but we need to tell them that thanks to AI, they will see pictures that aren't true, they will hear voices that aren't true. Um, it's too late, maybe, but um, I don't know. I wonder, don't we need to uh, have more institutional campaigns uh, like bombarding mm, citizens with these messages? Hola, gracias. Thanks. My question is about the relationship between hate speech and free speech. My question is, whom should define the red uh, line between these two concepts? And how should we define this red line between both concepts? to put an end to this hate speech against the LGBTIQ community, against Jewish people, and what should be the role of European institutions in defining, defining this red line? Thank you. In the um, misinformation campaigns, bots have played an important role, but we're also seeing now the uh, important extent of uh, artificial intelligence. We've seen it expanding in the social media and we see that uh, people uh, are experts in these uh, tools. So which is the stand um, in the in the European Parliament? What do you think about this? Thank you. So I, I, I would speak in English and then I will translate it myself in Spanish or in Catalan. Is it fine? Or he de parlar català millor? Estan traduint ja. Sí, sí, sí. Pots, pots fer-ho directament en anglès. Val, però si parlo anglès no fa cal, no cal que tradueixin. OK. Uh, thank you very much for your great examples and most of them were connected to the Jewish population. And it, it's quite clear because Germany that was the narrative Germany faced to the recent years. But I would say that uh, the disinformation existed always, and even the church, the religion used it. Because uh, if you are disinformed, somebody can profit. And it's always the question of benefits, and it will never disappear. So my question is, since it's reality, and it will not vanish, neither tomorrow nor the other day. Um, how can the population be prepared to distinguish, thanks to discourse analysis, whether there's something um, subjective or something objective? And how can the future journalist be obliged to follow the ethic code and the moral code that they sometimes violate just because of the 
they're paid better and they're biased. So that's my question. Uh, la pregunta es, ah, no, cal, pero, I believe there is one last uh, question, Mrs. Vice President. President, to ask more of a technical question. It's like um, Instagram users or Facebook Facebook users, for example, they already have uh, many warnings of the social media when you're looking some content, uh, and for sure, using social media inside the European Union is not the same as using it in another continent. The content you are able to see, it's different. And there are some warnings already, uh, I suppose, um, because of the legislation that has been done in recent years. And I wanted to ask what it would be the next step uh, for the European Union dealing with these big techs, like uh, all meta social media, for example, um, in order to address more directly this kind of content because uh, usually for example you get to see if there is a, a violent content online there is a warning for it or what they did with COVID every time you um, posted something or say in the word vaccine or COVID-19 already appear right the, uh, like behind the post or story or whatever it's a warning for the user that maybe this information should be um, revised. So, well, what is what would be the next step for legislating something like that? Thank you. Okay, th this was the last question. So, did you take good notes? Do you want me to um, go one after the other, or do you want to start answering to all of them? I, I think I took good notes, and, and I thank you. These were, without exception, absolutely excellent questions, and they are sometimes interlinked, so that, I think that is, that is why I will try to, to maybe answer them all together, um, if you don't mind, because exa already the second question was sort of an answer to the first. I mean, First of all, I want to say we, we try not to use the, the, the notion fake news. I sometimes do, sorry, but we actually try to speak about disinformation because, um, because and it's not misinformation, it's disinformation, because as long as someone says something which you believe is not true, it is very difficult to actually um, address it legally sometimes even morally. But um, disinformation, therefore, we use because it, there is an intention behind it. There is an, the intention not only to lie, but also to have a certain effect with it. And that is, that is the part that we uh, feel we are um, legitimized to address legally. Because again, we are proud of the freedom of speech and we we do not want to go through every social media um, uh, um, uh, program whatever or, or every newspaper or every TV channel and say look this was not correct and that was not correct we have to really focus on on those message that messages that are being sent to disinform Okay, and what can we do? Actually, um, yes, it was mentioned by the two first speakers. Uh, we can ban media, and we did in the European Union uh, with two um, Russian uh, TV channels. Um, it's really the absolute ultima ratio. It's really the last, the bazooka, so to say, um, because it is, of course, a big, um, um, it, it does interfere into, into media freedom. but. These, um, especially the, the Russian channels, um, it, is, it is proven that not only they, they spread lies, but they do this to um, reach certain goals, be it in Ukraine, be it to destabilize um, Western democracies. So, so we do have a weapon and we use it. Um, but really only um, as a last solution. And what else can we do to, to the second speaker? Um, 
what can media do also? Um, well, first of all, and, and I reflected in, in, in a lot of questions, um, the, the responsible people in media, first of all, have to, have to deal with it. They have to be aware not to fall in the trap themselves and they have to know how to react if you, if you, if you run into disinformation. So um, I think it's a, a discussion everywhere. Do you, if you have a panel discussion, for example, in a talk show, do you invite someone who has this completely contrary um, opinion where you would feel this is close to disinformation. Look at the Russian war in Ukraine with someone saying, well, yes, but Ukraine actually mm -hmm, was, was, um, was provoking or whatever. Do you invite this kind of people? Now, that has to be decided at, at, at the level, and, but the, the, the point is never ever should it happen, what, what I once actually saw myself, a talk show where you had a one-on-one -on -one discussion and there was one person saying um, LGBTI is, is a disease, I mean being homosexual is a disease, and you had one LGBTI activist arguing against it. Because then of course you, you, you make it look like it's just too opinions that you can have and you can you can think this one is better or that one is better and this of course is not something that media responsible media should never do if you think it is necessary to dismantle uh, a, a conspiracy theorist or, or whoever then at least make it clear that this is being you know either by by putting one and like for others, which, is, which reflects also probably the majorities or maybe five or I don't know, but, but making absolutely clear that this is a highly disputed um, opinion and, and, and not one that you can just take as easily as the other one, um, if you invite such people at all. But, uh, but this, this and, and this sometimes happens that you have like, okay, you can, I don't know if, if any other example comes to my mind now, but but I think this this uh, this example of homosexuality is an absolutely striking one, or or maybe if you have um, people who people of color have per se a, a lower in intelligence rate than white people, and you just put one here and one there and let them discuss. No, you see this is this is of course something that that media has to, has, to, um, has to stay neutral, but when it comes to this sort of, when it comes to disinformation, not, not just maybe someone of a different opinion or maybe even someone who tells lies, but disinformation has to take a stance. Um, so, um, and, and, what, what the third speaker said, of course, is absolutely crucial, is media literacy. We have to, as, as she said, we really have to get our population to, to, to sense this and to know how to deal with it. Now, now, where can you start? Of course, you always start in schools. We have to do that. And I can say for my country, I think it's not enough that we're doing there yet. Um, we, we try it, for example, we have European Parliament ambassador schools, so, so when it comes to lies on the European Union, we, we really try to, 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 to give the, the, a proper um, image of what we're doing. Not, we're not perfect, but sort of, you know, showing it as it is, as we perceive it is. Because this, of course, if I may say that, um, you, you quoted Hannah Arendt, um, I mean, she's, she's Jewish, so sorry if I refer to that so often, but of course she had experienced what, what disinformation can do at the worst. But I, I, I actually, I, I used to be a judge, as I said, and once we did an experiment, um, uh, someone showed us um, a, 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 like, a, like a puppet that was turning in one direction and put it on the wall, and then please write down what you have seen. And I, probably three quarters of the people wrote down, I see a puppet that is turning to the left. And about one, the, the, and the rest said, I see, a, I see a 
puppet that is turning to the right. And we were laughing at them and saying, I mean, come on, you can't even distinguish left from right. Uh, left from right. But the, the solution was that indeed, um, with this image, with this very special image, depending on which part of the brain, the left or the right, is your dominant one, you actually saw it differently. So this was done to make us judges um, aware that if you have someone in court who says, I'm 100% sure I saw this and that, it is not the reality. It is the perception of this and the memory of this single person. So there, there just is no such thing as reality uh, where we can all agree upon it. It's, 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 it's as, as easy and as complicated on that. So, so again, we cannot, and that, that leads me to, to, to the fourth uh, um, point, who defines what is hate speech and what is free speech? Um, of course, we have criminal laws. So that is very clear as soon as it becomes a, 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 a threat to the, to the security of a person, as soon as it crosses the, the, the lines of, um, of, of any legal, uh, um, whatever you have, code penal uh, in, in, in your, or whatever law in, in, your, um, in your country, it is, it is easy. But then you have this gray zone. Um, and we tried to find rules for this, um, to, to, to have people say this is dangerous and to report it, and then to have the, um, the platform being obliged to take it down if it was potentially damaging to, um, for example, the security or the health um, of, of a person. Um, but it is, it stays, this is really the most, where is it's not a black and white, and how to deal with the grey is really the, um, um, the the most difficult question, I would say. Um, when it comes to AI, uh, we actually just also, I think, a couple of weeks ago, adopted adopted the Parliament's position on our AI Act, and I have to say that the European Union actually is the um, the level of of legislation where we have been very, very successful on limiting the power of the big tech giants. We did this already with the GDPR when it came to the question on collecting data. So in Europe, we have the strict, we have very strict rules on if, on how these companies, but not, not only these companies, are allowed to, to, to store and to use the, your data. Because of course your data is becoming in our modern world more and more sort of you. I mean, you can be completely manipulated if someone has a lot of data about you. Um, so, so we have very strict rules on this with the gen general data protection regulation. And what we have seen is actually, we were, it, was, it was difficult. It took us seven years to, to get there. And it was highly disputed because it was sort of complicated and, and you know, for, for, for businesses, they had to fill in forms and la la la. But it turned out that it was a very, very um, effective weapon and that it was copied by legislation all over the world. Over 70 countries actually copied the GDPR. And even in California they did. So, so you are the master of your data. You decide, do I want, do I, do I allow, if I, if I use this, and I, I, and I go on a website and they, a, they have to ask me, may I collect your data for that and that purpose? And I am allowed to say no. Now we have to do it. Huh? I mean, how many people just go allow all? It's, I mean, I, I can swear it's just one click more to say no. Because if you go on settings, then you can say reject all. It's just one click more, it's not that difficult. But people just don't do it. But it's not, we can't do any more than that. And I can, I can actually just ask you, go on settings and say reject all. If they want to sell you something, they're still gonna, gonna have the, the complete, um, you're not gonna be, be limited to anything. They still, they still want you to buy there. So, um, so but don't give away your data. Um, and the AI Act now, um, I don't, we don't have very much time left, I'm sorry. Just, just very roughly will um, we'll be about um, how do we, do we allow our AI and how? 
and we because we can't we can't keep up with the developments the technical developments we decided to look at it from the uh, result side from the effect side so we have four categories we have some that we completely ban which is for example social scoring as in china which is for example emotional recognition that people can you know you can i look at the screen now and i see you are you're a de depressive person or you are you have cancer or something like that or you are you know in love uh, this kind of thing we 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 will f that is forbidden we have some that we will regulate which is for example facial recognition we will have some that we allow but you have to put a, you have to you have to um you have to signal that it is artificial intelligence for example texts created by chat gpt or um, deep fakes it's not dangerous anymore when you have a photo and it says, or, or a video, that, and it says this is, this is created by AI. Then it's not dangerous anymore. So you can do it, but you have to say it's AI. And the fourth is, is where we just let it go. It's, it's just fine, like, like your navigation system or whatever. So, so this is what, how we want to address AI. Um, two questions left. Um, yeah, subjective or objective, disinformation always existed. Yes, it did, but there is no, everything that we say or do is subjective. We do not, we do never give anything objective. Um, so, so, so we really have to let go of this concept that there is anything that is absolute. It's not. Um, but, um, um, I, I totally agree with the, with the ethics code that the last but one speaker actually referred to. We need this within, um, within the media world. Um, someone actually in Germany came up with the idea of having um, journalists, but also people who create films, having them certified to be so, sort of like an, as you uh, who, who actually commit to certain to an ethics code, for example, and therefore become certified, who say, for example, I will never use AI without, without saying that I do, or I will, um, whatever ethics code you do, and then to have like, a, like certified people where, where you have, as a user, you can see this is someone I might be able to trust more than others. Um, so this this could be an idea. Um, yes, and then on on the uh, how do we deal with the with the um, with with platforms like Instagram, Facebook, where we already have warnings. The interesting thing also is these warnings are very different all across the world, um, or the bans. I mean, in in the US, as soon as you see uh, like too much of a female breast. Or, or too much naked skin, your your photo gets banned from 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 social media, even if it's a piece of art, which is which is really bizarre. They have this very you know peculiar notion of of, of being you know nakedness is is something very dangerous. Whereas whereas, sorry to say it again, in my country, if you if you deny that the Holocaust took place, it's a it's a criminal offense, it's a crime. Um, so so you get banned immediately for that. Um, whereas in another country, it might be very religious questions. You know, if you in, in Arab countries, as soon as you say something, anything against Allah, you will be banned immediately. So this is and there you see how that it is not objective. It is not. Um, and therefore, again, we have to we have to say freedom of speech is something very important. We have we we have to give rules. We have to make these rules being applied, and we have to deal with the with the um, with the clear offences and the extremes. And 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 maybe that as a very last point, we have to be aware that we have to adapt constantly. This this world is changing constantly, and we really have to be aware that we have to go, especially in legislation, every step um, and, and keep a close eye on it. And, and I'm, I'm very happy to see 
not to see but to know that there is a big crowd of young people who, who are interested in this subject and who, who see the, the needs, because this is what we need. We need your generation to be aware of it and your generation to, to spread the news that you actually asked us to do. You have to do it too, because you are much more credible in your peer group than, than I am. I'm a politician, I'm far away, but if you say that within your, I don't know, friends and, and sports club and, and, and universities, this is much more credible. So, so we all have to work together to, to make this work. Um, Ms. Vice President, thank you so much for the level of the questions and your answers. They were high quality um, questions. We've spoken about hate speech and free speech and literacy, artificial intelligence, but there's one last question question all Europeans may be wondering regarding disinformation. Could disinformation become a tool of political inference from abroad? We've seen it with the invasion of Ukraine. So as a war weapon, is the European Union preparing any type of legislation, any element to combat um, disinformation regarding this sense, regarding a war situation? Yes, it, it, is, it is already a threat. It has already been a threat. Um, we know that, as uh, for example, Brexit uh, or also the French elections, also the German elections, there were uh, um, attempts, especially of Russia, to, to interfere. Um, and yes, we are acting uh, on very different levels. We are at the moment um, debating um, a, uh, a piece of legislation on foreign interference or tackling uh, foreign interference. Um, as well as also um, political advertisement to make it more clear this is this is people who try to influence you um, politically. Um, we uh, we also as a parliament try to to develop tools. Um, we have found out that it is it does not work to take a piece of disinformation and and sort of say this is being spread but it is not true. This doesn't work what we what works better is to create uh, counter content so so to react on it by spreading the 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 truth which counters this this uh, disinformation um, and um, to to we are we are preparing these things in advance because we try to um, to sense where these attacks are going to come. And there are some which are, which are obvious that goes, go to um, a warning of election fraud. This is very common or um, uh, of spe specific um, actors that, that are close to the Russian or whoever foreign interference, um, that they are being denied access to whatever, or that they, they, they are disadvantaged. Um, in the discussion, so we are we are trying to prepare this in advance, and if we we did not foresee it, then to act very quickly. Um, and there are there are other other tools like like creating networks where we where we um, so that we can sense earlier what is going to happen. But unfortunately, it, it is always a reactive process. I mean, um, we we. So, so, so what we do in the very first place is try to, to place the, the positive images and to give them a high, um, a high um, importance um, to, to actually show the good parts um, of, or the, the good sides of democracy, the good sides of the European Union, what, what we do, and, and, and to, to make that also, uh, also a weapon against this disinformation. Uh, uh, Ms. Vice President, thank you so much for everything you have told us here today. I don't know whether citizens will trust European institutions, but you at least were capable of answering everything and you have a clear criteria, which I believe is very important. Absolute truth does not exist. And we saw this as a revealed truth for many years. 
um, in Europe. And honestly, I don't think citizens lived better with their freedoms and rights. So it's very good to find a political authority that knows that truth does not exist, but there's more convenient truths so that everybody can live in a dignified space uh, where they can coexist. So it's very good to know that there's a vice president, very well informed, very well prepared in these matters, answering all our questions, because normally politicians don't know how to do this, answer all questions. So it's very important that you can. And I believe that this debate has been very valuable for us all. It's been very relevant, very interesting. And congratulations and thank you very much once again for your participation. Thank, thank you. Thank you for this very fruitful discussion and good luck for the future. Okay, so now that the